Thank you. Welcome. Morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for coming. We're so pleased to have you with us. Um, so Divya, I'm going to hand it over to you. And um, I, Divya has woken up at the crack of dawn. It's probably still dark out where she is to talk to us. And we're so grateful to you for doing that. Um, so uh, let's listen to Divya. And then if we have time afterwards, we can ask questions um, of people who presented uh, today. So um, everybody make sure you're muted and Divya, take it away. Um, the reason I was very excited and enthused to come here was to share with you what has been happening uh, with the COVID-19 and my homeopathic experience with it. So um, just like things in life happen, by chance, a patient first called me from the United States because there and also in Canada, um, most patients are not admitted. Whereas at the same time in India, and even now, most patients who test positive are being admitted, those who are asymptomatic, most are being quarantined in government facilities because a lot of people here live in very close quarters and quarantine at home may not be possible for them. And hence my first access to the patients were from the United States. And I, um, this was a COVID positive patient sent home with Tylenol uh, and asked to report if he was breathless. This is a young uh, male adult of about 35 years. Uh, and I took a complete detailed history as I, did, as I do. So it was a three hour intake that I took. The, um, in, very, in brief, I will just tell you the methodology that I used and that I use in these cases. It's based on um, the, the work that I am at now after 30 years of practice. And that is in the understanding that our body mechanisms all are controlled by the automatic or the involuntary part of the brain. And that, that's kind of intuitive because it's like we don't get up and control our body functions. This automatic part of the brain, which is 95% of our brain mass, functions in the form of circuits. It forms neural circuits and creates a pre-programmed response. So we are born with some of these circuits that help us to function, uh, also survive. Like if we put our hands in hot water, we would instinctively pull it out. We also add new circuits as we learn walking, talking, swimming, dancing, driving. We are adding circuits into this program so that they can also function on the auto mode. The second premise it's based on is the understanding of the Pavlovian model. That is the dog, the food and the bell experiment. This demonstrated very early on that these pre-programmed circuits, neural circuits in our automatic brain are corruptible, that we could introduce some uh, object from the periphery, from the environment, which can, if repeated over a period of time, change the natural functioning of the body. So like he changed the natural functioning of our digestive system, which should be triggered only by food, visual or food smell, but it got triggered even by a bell, which really doesn't make any sense at all. It's not efficient at all. The third aspect or the understanding that leads to the methodology is what neuroscience calls blind sighting, whereby watching experiments of actions carried out by a person, they were able to demonstrate in the brain neural circuits that the actual decision or the actual first electronic activity showing that the movement is going to take place, takes place three, seven, five milliseconds before the voluntary or conscious mind actually recognizes that they are going to do the action. This means that the question of free will is put into uh, 
question mark that we something that we think we have decided is actually pre-decided a few seconds before through this automatic brain and it was also then found out that visual perceptual stimuli from the environment would affect the decision making without us consciously realizing it so visual things from the environment would change the way we would respond to stimuli or react and we would not remember or realize even later that we actually ever saw that thing that's called the blind sighting so understanding this idea i began to take the case from the chief complained trying to focus purely on the automatic brain understanding that the program for the functioning of our body is not in the area of the brain related to thought and emotion but it's in this pre-programmed auto circuitry the roots to stimulate the automatic brain is the five senses just like if we wanted to stimulate our cognitive brain we needed to do thinking and we put on a functional mri cap and we were given quizzes or puzzles to do this part of our brain lights up but if we are given textures to touch with eyes closed or food to taste or we sounds to recognize then this automatic part of the brain naturally shows a higher neuronal activity understanding this i began to take the case from the chief complaint focusing only on the five senses through this you enter the automatic brain now as we understood that these circuits get formed as well and get corrupted as well the time and the chance of this happening the most is in childhood because that's when we are constantly being exposed to new stimuli of which we do not yet have the knowledge or the skill set to analyze or understand it we are also learning new things at a really 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 rapid rate and as we grow older we kind of tend to follow a routine and learn things much less not that we cannot but that's just what we do hence the chance of something corrupting our natural pre programming of our body function is more in childhood than later on the fourth advance of neuroscience that helps us get to these areas that are corrupted is the latest understanding that memory is in two types the cognitive memory and visual memory the visual memory is stored in this automatic brain and obviously as we spoke the five senses send their input constantly to this brain and therefore it eventually becomes obvious that the memories would be stored in this part of the brain not as themes and thoughts but as photographs almost like instagram flash photos or short youtube video clips these are stored randomly they're not stored in sequential order and cannot be called out at will but are often triggered even in our own lives as say we walk down a street and maybe somebody walks past whose hair or particular way of holding the body reminds you of your math school teacher in grade 4 and instantly you're transported to that classroom with everybody around the windows the 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 uh, board the chalk the person sitting next to you and at that moment you would remember everything about this person sitting next to you what where he lived what he wears how he looks how he spoke his name whereas if i were to ask your cognizance memory in your fourth grade maths class who was the person sitting next to you you'd say i absolutely haven't a clue i don't even remember what i did yesterday how do you expect me to remember what's happening there so the experiments that actually showed us this memory 
were done uh, in awake surgeries. Brain surgeries are often awake surgeries to prevent us damaging parts of the brain when the neurosurgeon goes in. This is also possible because the brain has no pain receptors. So once you enter the actual brain matter, there's no pain. And this helps keeping the person alert, helps the neurosurgeon to know that he's not damaging vital parts of a person while he's operating. Here is where with voluntary participation of the patients, they stimulated gently different areas of the brain and were able to confirm that our memory of our childhood is stored as these flashbacks that one can call out if one triggers through the five senses. So as we take the patient's complaints through the five senses and he enters and stimulates the automatic brain, these flashbacks that are always there anyway are now more apparent to the patient who is putting his attention on this part of the brain as opposed to the thinking brain. And then as we go back to these flashbacks, I found that the age the patient tends to go and stop as the key age where the inputs are most significant is often between the ages of five and seven. I collect all the visual perceptual data in that area that the person describes. Then I come back to the chief complaint and examine more of it in detail until that spontaneous link in that complaint links to one of those objects in that perceptual area. I also look at the triggers that have triggered this present episode because if a circuit is formed in childhood, it may just stay dormant, may not even create any health problems. But later on, if you are in an environment where that object in that visual circuit is now constantly there and is associated with chemical changes within the body, it will then trigger the whole system to go into a complete mess up and complete failure. So looking at the precipitating circuit, which means where were you when the problem started, looking at the background and taking the data, taking the actual symptoms of the chief complaint links it to the so-called Pavlovian bell in childhood that would have damaged the circuit. So as this first patient began to speak to me, I started with the first symptom that he had, which was cough. He started his complaints with cough and the cough he felt was suffocative. His nose was blocked as well. He described the sensation in the nose as if there was water that was going into his nose and so he couldn't breathe. This symptom description I have found in at least 50% of the COVID cases where they link their sensation as if in their nose or throat to water entering in the nose. This took him to the flashback of the first time he learned swimming, where he was pushed into the pool, which in India, this is how they would often, many people would believe you, you learn swimming the best by just being thrown into the pool. So he was thrown into the pool and he remembered the sensation experience state of that water going into the nose and him feeling completely choked and unable to breathe at that time. Then I focused on the visual and perceptual stimuli in the background because this he remembers. He remembers the water going into the nose. He remembers in his memory that feeling of the suffocation, his fear, his pride, his anger, everything. What he does not remember here, but goes into the background and into the automatic brain is what all was around. Because the cognizant memory doesn't consider this important. As I asked him what was around, he described tall false Ashoka trees all around this cement pool. So there's a pool and then there's a cement kind of porch all around it. Then there's a wall. And 
outside this wall are these tall trees that are lining and giving a kind of private space to this entire pool. So I said, what all are you seeing? Go towards the wall, on the floor, whatever little crumpled paper even that you see right now is important. And then he said, I would often go there swimming in the evening and towards the sunset time, there would often be bats hanging on these trees. The moment I heard that, I thought, this is interesting because we of course know the link of the bat with the coronavirus. And here is this patient linking his sensation to a moment in childhood where he felt the same sensation, where in the background where were these bats that didn't bother him at all, but they were visual stimuli that obviously repeatedly entered his automatic brain. I then followed the different visuals that come up. And the technique that I use in this is that as a patient gives one visual that comes up, uh, they often, they will suggest the second visual to you. For example, if he will describe the pool and he would say there's a fence around it and then say, oh no, there's no fence around it. Then it obviously means that there was another visual picture coming out from the background that must have this fence. And that's why he gets confused. So then I asked the patient, so what is the scene from childhood where you see the fence around? And then I go into that scene. In this way, by picking his cues as to which are those scenes coming out behind the scene we are talking about, I reach his base scene. In the process of doing this, he started coughing again as he was talking. And when I asked him about the cough, he said, it feels like somebody is squeezing my throat. And he said, this sensation I have even in my head constantly with the fever. It's like my head is being squeezed and my throat is being squeezed constantly. It doesn't allow him to sleep. As I took him back to this squeeze sensation, he went to some scenes in childhood, some school area, and back to his childhood home. As he was describing the environment around his house, I encouraged the patient to keep the visual in front of them. And if any other flashback in that area comes, to instantly go there. And then he said, of course, there were other things that he spoke in between, but what he then said was, when I was seven or eight, I remember waking up in the night and I saw these black bed bugs all over my bed that were biting me. And that's why I woke up. And I picked up these bed bugs and I squeezed them all with my hand. So I noticed, I said, here was this bat at the background of his nose sensation and these bugs that confluenced with the squeeze sensation that he described in his throat and his head. In a lot of the other scenes that he spoke about his school or a trip that he took, there were a lot of animals in the background, particularly one sand heap where he would play uh, because it was construction area where there would be a lot of crabs in that area, also which come from the arthropod or the insect family. As I was wondering, because of course I know the connection of the bat, and I began to look up bugs and bat. Is there a connection of the bugs and the bat? And of course there are many bug-eating bats that eat a lot of bugs, but there are fruit-eating bats. So I said, this is too many, not significant. But then I found that there are a group of 20 bugs only that parasite the bat that are blood sucking on the bat. And the big group of these comes from the family Cymex, which is the same genus from which is the bed bug. In fact, if you read the Wikipedia for bat bugs, as they are called, it describes that these are the closest relatives to the bed bug. In fact, it looks so similar that you cannot even tell the difference. Now, this to me was like those hair standing little chill moment, right? Here is a patient who has COVID, COVID positive. We know the connection with the bat. He's coming to a remedy of bed bug, which 
obviously neither he or I knew has any connection to the bat itself. Cymex is not a remedy that we give often, right? Even in my practice, and I give unusual remedies, I probably have three cases of Cymex in the last 25 years. So for this remedy to come up in this case, after a detailed case taking with an obvious connection to the bat was to me interesting at this point. I have to also tell you that in the past, I have treated cases of dengue and malarias in outbreaks in Mumbai. And I have not found a single remedy that comes out in these cases. I've had to use different remedies all the time. In dengue, it was their constitutional remedy. And in malaria, they often changed to an acute remedy. Hence, I'm not a big proponent or a even advocate or believer of genus epidemicus until this happened. Post this, there were other cases that began to come and notably, uh, there is one, there's a patient who was referred to me from a hospital who, though now asymptomatic, she continued to test positive. It's over three weeks, but her test has not been turning negative. Hence, they're not discharging. According to Indian standards, they will not discharge the patient till two tests are negative. So she's stuck in the hospital for three weeks, occupying a bed that could be used by somebody else because her test just doesn't come negative. She also has that symptom, which if you see in patients is confirmatory for COVID. The absence of it does not rule out COVID and that is the lack of smell. Also lack of taste, but the lack of smell, complete lack of smell is diagnostic of this disease. She, has this, she had this complete lack of smell still persisting. As I took her history in the same manner and took her symptoms, she described a sensation of pulling in her chest at the onset of her fever. Then as I went back to her childhood and different scenes that emerged, there was a moment when she came to her school and in the school she described trees, gulmohar trees, which are from leguminosi family. Next to it was another leguminosi, she didn't know the name, with the pods. And she remembers breaking the pods. I knew this area was significant because she had described her throat sensation as extremely dry and rough. And those were the words she used while describing the texture of this pod, that it is dry and it is rough. So I knew there is something over here which is significant. As I was speaking to her and asking her, tell me more, what all did you see? What was happening there? She described that often, once she remembers one particular strong day that she was going out to play. This was the usual area of play. And suddenly she had this thought that every day there are so many ants over here. And if I go there and play, I am stepping on these ants and I'm crushing them. So I will not go to play. So I said, were there ants? She said, yeah, along these flowers and leaves and these pods, there were always ants and often ants would kind of come up the hand or the leg. And then she said, oh, I forgot to tell you. About three years ago, I was diagnosed as some kind of borderline personality disorder or some psychosis because I was getting hallucinations and delusions. And my delusion at that time was that there were ants that would be crawling all over my body. Like they would crawl in a single line. Like how when there's orange juice and you know how the ants will come in a line, they would come in a single line. And she said, I wouldn't, and it would remind me of this childhood scene where there were these ants. And I wouldn't really recognize whether they were really there on me or it was just my imagination. Even in childhood, she said, I had this time of when I would think I'm going to step on these ants. I wasn't really sure whether they were ants or I was imagining them sometimes. This was, again, bringing us to this insect, which was very interesting. I then went back to her chief complaint and I said, so tell me what is that sensation in your chest? And then she said, 
the sensation is like you know if you when you are bitten by a mosquito and initially you don't feel anything but then when it sucks the blood there is a pulling sensation that you get at that time that's the kind of sensation that i have i said to her have you had another sensation like this apart from a mosquito and she said yes you know in the bed when you get those small black marker marker is the colloquial name they look like ladybugs but they are black in color those things that are in your bed that when it bites you has that similar thing because when they first bite you you don't feel it but later on when they're sucking or just finished that's the sensation you got so again here was this case through her own state coming to this exact sensation in her chief complaint now linking it back to the bad bed bug it also makes sense why this patient is lingering on with this for 21 days because she has already a predisposition strong predisposition towards the insect she is probably in her original case a formica rufa case which is now this has got acutely uh, that part of her circuit has got linked to the present epidemic and she therefore has it in that sense in a strong manner right this case when my assistant was listening to me the terminology she used was it's almost freaky because it's like she listened to my lecture and she was kind of it's almost like she had heard me tell my homeopathic my group because i've been telling them and that she was actually quoting me that this is how a patient would speak um a few days ago i spoke to another uh, person who is not yet got tested but she definitely has covid the symptoms are very clear um the physician who is looking at covid cases here in mumbai has certified that definitely it is covid the she when i asked her about the sensation she described it like flickering lights she had a throbbing headache with flickering lights the flickering lights instantly took her to a visual of her office space and as she was describing her office space she described that she faces the door with a glass slit and that bothers her because she can then see people the silhouettes of people and because she knows them she can recognize them or they will wave to her and this distracts her so she said i put a nice decorative piece somebody gave me it's a jute thread with uh, wooden clips on it where you can put different photographs and these wooden clips have the pictures of bed bugs uh, i mean ladybugs on it and i was like this can't be happening at this point i have to tell you i've started to get scared i've begun to wonder am i transmitting thought <laughs> to the patient by not saying anything you understand because it's just it's too freaky if, if if i may say so it's just like too much and too often i then took her entire case and then she waited for her to say the bed bug at any point she came to insects and ants and cockroaches but she didn't say so then i said you know you mentioned the bed bug by mistake in the beginning and uh, is there any experience with that and she said oh yeah that's because since january in my room here and that's the room she's been quarantined in in the bed we found many bed bugs so we had one pest control treatment and we are supposed to have the next one but because of the lockdown we haven't been able to have that and also in february where i went to a school she does therapy so she went to the school um, um a low income group school and from the wooden benches she said where we were sitting there were these bed bugs crawling so again not only was she coming to this experience but it's also recent it's all happening from this january february and she's sitting in this very room at this point i asked her a leading question because now it this is i've been watching these cases for the last one month so if i found the bed bug i said do you have any experience with bats in your life and she said when i first moved into this building the one she lives in the neighbor 
on the same floor that she has. Suddenly there were ba a bat that had entered and it had created a whole lot of excitement and they'd all kind of gone out and tried to get the bat out. And this is the very house she lives in with the neighbor who lives just next to her. Uh, this neighbor's house was also interesting because in one of the flashbacks, as she was telling me and she described a kitchen and she said, no, no, probably this is not the kitchen. This is the kitchen in my neighbor's house. But I ignored that because I thought that was too recent and, and kitchen and I just went to the background. But it's interesting that in those visuals, it was the same bat house kitchen that had come up. There's another two son and mother who um, were COVID positive. It's also interesting because the mother, I mean the wife and the daughter who live in the same house are in close quarters, didn't test positive, though being in constant contact. It was only the mother and the son. And uh, he then described, um, while giving his history, he said, oh, um, by the way, I don't like bats. And I don't know why he said that. It's just out of randomly that he said that. And then he said that four months ago, his mother was sitting on this couch in the room when she was bitten. And they thought it's allergy. And eventually the pest control person with ultraviolet light showed them in that couch that there were bed bugs. The bed bugs were only on this couch and in the mother's room. And this mother is the one who took the longest to recover. Everybody else from that group that tested positive came back home, but she continued to be in the ICU. And again, her test kept coming positive, negative, positive, negative. So they weren't able to release her, right? Uh, the, this mother and son, the son describes, are very alike in personality. And he also described, we are both OCD. They're both highly OCD. And he said, it's, it got much worse, of course, during the COVID time. I've also seen a lot of patients who inherently have a lot of the finickiness and I don't like anything dirty or creepy, crawly things more in the group of people who are testing COVID positive. Um, a, a doctor who has been aware of the work in the cases called me just two days ago and he said, my staff, the, the security officer, who he says, look, he can't talk to you on Zoom or whatever, or even the phone. He comes from a village. He won't be able to do all this. But can you talk to him on the phone and see what you want to give him? So I asked him, I said, tell me about your fever. When did your fever start in the local language? And he said, well, I slept on my bed. Uh, I slept on the tiled floor in my cabin. Uh, and the floor was cold and I put on the fan at a fast speed. And uh, that's probably why I got the fever. And my joints were hurting in the morning. Um, as I went through my routine uh, circuit very quickly, 15 minutes on the phone, and he said, the reason that I put my bed up, uh, I'm, I was sleeping on the floor, was that since one month, I have bed bug infestation. And I've been putting kerosene. This is the old village thing. I've been putting kerosene and putting my bed out on the terrace in the sun. But every time I bring it back in the night, there are still the bed bugs. So since the last three days, I didn't bring the bed down at all. And I decided I will sleep on the floor because the bed bugs were biting me and I kept killing them all night. And that's when he got the fever. So I said to the doctor, I'm quite sure he's going to test positive. So go ahead and do the test and quarantine him. And we started him on the remedy. So this is the kind of cases and the frequency with which I am seeing them as yet, I am taking every case as far as possible in detail. I do the full three hour intake, except for maybe this gentleman, because the data is still, I have 30 cases, right? I think they are significant. Homeopathically, we know they are significant. To get a case of, to get Cymex, so I get either bat or insect, or I just get the bed bug directly. Or in some cases, I get the bat and the bed bug. This is how the pattern has been coming through. So one patient, for example, came to a forest area where she described going with her father, all four huddled in this dark, cold place, going on a night walk with a little torch. And in the background, there are bats doing chi 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 and flying around and crickets and insects in that same scene, right? And that's the visual that she comes to. So if I get bat and insect, I know this is 
the connect SIMEX. If I get the bed bug, of course, directly, which I am, or if I get um, other blood sucking arthropods, I then ask them a direct question about the bed bug. And there is almost invariably a very recent experience that is happening with it and a very intense one. This, with this remedy to happen so frequently, I mean, if it was like an arsenic alb or a bryonia or a eupatorium, we still see this, but Cymex, that's one. Second, the connect of it with the bat bug and the bat, I mean, this is just like getting too much of a coincidence. There is something happening here. Uh, I have put forth all my papers and I'm waiting for the ethical committee of some hospitals to give us the permission to go ahead and do an adjuvant treatment of homeopathy in the cases in the hospital. I'm hoping this will go through. Uh, I'm hoping it will be a multi-centric trial where then I will get a statistically significant number, which would be 120, 60 placebo and 60 uh, on the remedy. Um, in the, but in the meantime, I've been collecting as much data as I can from cases, taking them at length, as well as collecting back data from patients who have just recovered and gone home because often you know we don't get them before and they've gone home but i've been collecting their back data in this detailed history so that if we get a large number in the hospital and I, and physically it's not possible to take every case then already the data will be available so that's what I'm actually seeing, I'm sorry, I've overshot the time, but I'm open for any questions uh, that you may have. I, the point I want to make here is, of course, we'd say that everybody knows about the bat and they would be thinking about the bat. But the significant thing here is whenever I take bat as significant, it comes in the background of an event. It's not like you're asking the person, tell me, are you, what are you afraid of? And then they tell you bat. Right. Also, the connect of the bed bug and the bat is definitely not something that anybody would have looked or read or thought about because there's no talk of vector and as a transmitting, you know, an insect vector as being a transmitting agent. Wow. <laughs> that was pretty awesome, Divya. Um, thank you. Uh, People, do we have any questions for Divya? Let's, um, I, it's a lot to digest, but um, please ask Divya questions. Um, just also the dosage I give is 1M three times a day because that's, if it's a case, uh, if it's a patient, 1M three times a day till their symptoms and fever, till fever abates and or symptoms drop by 50%, then twice a day till they're about 80, 90% better, and then once a day till Ideally, of course, we can decide, but this kind of is the protocol that's working. For prophylaxis, twice a day, for two days, repeated after one week. If it is a healthcare worker, twice a day for three days. So although this has not been officially permitted, many of the hospitals through some doctors I know have taken the medicine from me and giving it to their healthcare staff those who want to take it. It has been given to some hutment areas. So at least close to two hutments each of 1600 each have already received it. I have photographs of it. That data, whether I can use or not is, is because it's not official permission yet, but they have been given it. So um, this is how we are using it so far. I just had a quick question. Divya, can you speak to the cases where they were geographically? Uh, so this is US, UK, India, and uh, Dubai. I have to also add that in the beginning, I did receive the input of the cases from Iran. And uh, in the repertorial, because I just received paper cases, I had suggested arsenic and camphor for those cases. It had come through in the repertory, but that's not how I kind of... Um, would like to prescribe and then I later did take the cases two of these cases who were given camphor right and tried to see if I did the detail of the cases what comes through um, it was not a very clear-cut case 
um, it was not like a clean case. These cases, what I call are clean, you know, definitive. I can, you know it, right? This was not like that. So I can't comment. But two of the cases that I have such seen in their um, first group of symptoms mentioned camphor. Uh, notably that lady who I told you with the delusion of ants, she talked about using and trying to unblock her nose using a kind of inhaler, which has menthol and camphor, you know, those kind of things in it. Uh, and I said, how do you know the smell of camphor? Because she said, camphor. she said, oh, a friend of mine when I was 15, her mother used to keep camphor all over the house. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. Could, you know, could there be differences in different countries of remedies and or could there be different groups of remedies? But eventually this patient went to this ant and this bed bug. Uh, the question that's in my mind that I woke up with this morning that I will ask her is why was that camphor put in that friend's house? Because camphor is a strong insecticidal. It is often used as insecticidal. So I've seen that at a superficial symptom level coming through in some cases. Uh, and now I'm wondering whether it's actually the link with the insect because the one of the areas of use for it is as an insecticide. Mm -hmm. So, um, so across these are, this is Dubai, uh, India, US, UK that I've seen these cases so far. Great. Anyone also, else? yeah. Yeah, you better ask because otherwise I'll keep talking. I'm kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any questions? I think everyone's just a little bit blown away. Well, um, what I would recommend is if you would also take the cases in whatever style that you do, please note what is coming and uh, get it back to me if you take a detailed case and let me know. At the end of your case, you could ask leading questions like specifically related to this to rule out or say, yes, is this there or not there? Um, that would be good data that is coming in. I'm also doing that in follow-ups that I'm watching my follow-ups very carefully, routine follow-ups to see what percentage of them are suddenly coming up with some dreams or some allergic bites that many of them are coming up like an you know, urticarial, which they've never had before. Some groups of patients have been coming up like that without symptoms, not uh, having fever or, but kind of showing that that state is spreading into the community in general, right? There was a chat yeah. question, yeah. There is a question here um, written, uh, somebody wrote in, are, are you, um, what percentage of cases were not Cimex in your experience? So, um, the, um, I, as of now, the, there is the cases that I saw, all of them that I was able to take in detail were Cimex. There were one or two that I just spoke on the phone and asked symptoms. The cases that I find are, may not come to this were the other ones who are positive but don't have symptoms you know like say for example a daughter had symptoms so they test the whole house right now the rest of them may not have symptoms may not ever have symptoms but they are the test is positive in these patients i don't get a clear cut you know if i ask a leading question maybe sometimes but that's not where you get this clear cut symptomatology so people who are positive without symptoms at all that's where i'm not finding this um, happening so like like i call a clean case like when anybody watching would say no doubt right and these are cases where in some distant there might be some connect with these you know with the cymex or with but that's just vague in the distance right there's a question, are you seeing complete recovery and no lingering cough or lethargy post after the negative test? So the number of cases that I've seen so far, I think there were only about one or two um, that uh, were lingering. But um, overall, I think the lethargy stays, again, variable. So I have this patient I spoke to, uh, this is data collection, somebody from the UK just recovered. Now, the interesting thing is this entire family, 
um, the father had it who tested positive. The daughter who was two years old but was not tested had same symptoms. The doctor said don't test and she had it. And uh, now there are four, the, four of them, three of them got it. She was not tested, but again, the doctor said, you're definite. Now, she has the best immunity in their house, right? The husband is the one who falls sick all the time. But he recovered within two days, whereas she lingered fever for 11 days and lethargy for one week later. This is the patient who in the background had that Mahabaleshwar story with the torch. And in the background, there were the bats and the insects. So again, I'm finding that those who linger are the ones who have had either a very strong experience, which is therefore getting triggered, or their baseline level is already a insect remedy. That's the time that they tend to linger. And they're not on homeopathy. Of course, they're not on their remedies. Mm -hmm. Divya, I've had two um, ant cases in the last two weeks. It's Jane. But they weren't, they weren't necessarily corona cases, but there was fear of. So I right. just find it really interesting and a lot of insects. Right. So as a preventive for these cases, I would, if they've come to ant, many of them come to ant if they're not symptomatic, but they are as a, but if they are coming to ant and there's this fear, their state is high, I would give them Cymex as the profile axis. I mean, today I'm saying this, if you had asked me 15 days ago, I was still watching and waiting. But today, if they come spontaneously to insect, give it to them as a profile axis. I have a question, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Devya. Nice to uh, listen to your cases. They were, they were really very illuminating. So uh, regarding the CIMEX case, I have a question. Did you take into account any prominent mental emotional symptom of the patient which could connect with the selection of the CIMEX? Because um, with COVID-19, this paranoid fear and all traumatic experiences around and all the aura is, you know, just full with the paranoia. So I think there cannot be a case where there is no mental emotional symptom in a patient. Did you recognize any of this and connect with the remedy you gave? So basically the way I take the case, I stay away from the asking the mental emotional because then it goes into this cognitive brain, right? Thought no, without process. Asking, without asking, so we have without, not to ask the mental symptom. No, we, have to, we have to field it. So as what came spontaneously, I told you was in that patient with that delusion of that ant, you know, the crawling and the paranoia about that. So what comes constantly is paranoia in general about cleanliness and OCD, not related only here, but about insects or ants or things touching or, you know, I don't want them to be in my food. This is something that came spontaneously. Mm -hmm. that's about all I mean and OCDs and very you know like very finicky about things this is what came and delusion like I told you this kind of delusional state that comes okay thank you, you very much I don't in the I don't take the traditional mental symptoms I if there is a key often emotional states come in but I take what's in the background over there right mm -hmm. rather than taking the rubric of the emotion I mean, it would be good to do both and then kind of do a correlation. But the problem is that once you start staying with the mental emotion, it becomes very difficult to shift to this part of the brain. So to keep the fidelity of that case-taking process, I, whenever a patient, so they'll come to a scene where they felt traumatized, maybe in childhood, like a parent's undergoing divorce and the fight. And I would say, I would... Let them stay with that feel and then say, now look around and tell me what you're seeing. Because, for example, in post-traumatic stress syndrome, right, it has been noted that, let's say, a veteran soldier has been tortured with, say, a gun and a knife, right? Now he comes out. For months later, every time he walks, he'll see a gun and a knife. He will get triggered, right? But he knows it. He knows why he's getting triggered. Right? He recognizes this emotion. If we recognize the emotion, and that's our key part, we are able to inhibit it because every circuit, emotional circuit, has a 
cortical inhibitor neuron, which we can inhibit by saying, look, I know this is not a gun. I know, you know, this is only a toy. This is not the same situation and you can break it. But supposing in that same room where he's tortured, there was crumpled paper lying near a waste bin, which has nothing to do with the torture. It's just lying there. This he will not remember, remember. But its input goes as visual perceptual data into this automatic brain. And the result of this is that when he goes out on a street six months later after analysis and thinking he's quite okay now, and somewhere in the distance he sees a waste bin with crumpled paper, he'll get a panic attack. But he doesn't know why he's got the panic attack. So we know for example, we know I, at this point, you know, you this happened to you and you hold this emotion inside you. But why are we not able to let go of it? We know it now. We know where it comes from. We are now grown adults, right? We are able to understand that, see the other person's point of view, but we're not able to let go. Often because that emotion keeps getting triggered by something in the periphery that we don't know. And what my aim therefore is, to look at that aspect that we don't know, which is triggering the same circuit, meaning the gun, the knife, that crumpled paper, each is part of that same neural circuit that triggers the same chemicals and fright reaction, right? Or panic or emotions, trauma that's associated. Gun and knife, you know, so you can deal with. But that fear and fright never leaves not because of the gun and knife, but because of that paper that we don't recognize. So in the aim to put the attention purely in that, this part I let go because we know this. And I look at that peripheral traumatic stimuli that is triggering that same emotional response. Saying if we give a remedy for that, right, then we'll actually break this circuit completely. And that's what I generally find that in a follow up, then patient will come and say, you know, this is how I used to be and feel. And now I don't feel that any longer. But Cymex by itself is a very poorly proved remedy. It has very, very few symptoms. And there are very few emotional symptoms actually that are there. One strong symptom is uh, wants to stretch the body out. This is a proven you know, symptom that is there, like 3 p.m. is another symptom I found. Convulsions with fever is something I found. But desire to stretch oneself out is um, a strong symptom uh, that is there. I want to add that uh, rubber or stretch is a source word of arthropods because arthropods have a strong, have a resilient a protein in their joints that allows them to basically how a flea jumps or the grasshopper jumps. It's because they have this highly elastic protein called resilin that is supposed to be probably the most elastic substance. Therefore, the word elasticity and rubber as a symptom in insect cases, as an expression in insect cases often comes through. One other point is a lot of the COVID cases, and now it's being seen more on ventilators. They've been finding that if they put them in a prone position, like on their abdomen, they're actually responding much better. This is, there are many case studies of this. Uh, when you look at prone position, there is medorhinum and there is uh, blata in that, right? And uh, so that's another interesting thing that kind of, shows that insect family in a peculiar symptom that's coming through. Uh, There's one question here. Um, just curious, have you heard of any of your colleagues prescribing Cymex independent of your experience? No, actually, I haven't as yet. I mean, I have, but uh, not independent of my experience. Because this is the group uh, that has heard my experience and have I have not heard anyone prescribe it independent of my experience. And given how poorly proven a remedy it is, it's a really yes. would be a very hard one to access except it with a method be. like yours. Absolutely. Also, um, when you read the pathophysiology of the bed bug bite, it contains uh, anticoagulant and antiplatelet aggregating factors. 
as well as an anesthetic and a vasodilation. If you have been also reading the latest stuff and the postmortem studies, they're now beginning to say this is probably not lung at all, but like you said, blood, and they are focusing on coagulopathies, coagulation, intramicrovascular injury, and coagulation as actually the key injury that is causing this entire damage. In addition to that, the response which is causing the um, mortality is like a cytokine storm response. Cytokine storm response are hyperimmune responses that are seen in allergic reactions, right? So they are seen, for example, snake venoms can give that, where the body goes into an over mode. But allergies also, which we know insect bites are the biggest um, allergent in that particular way, uh, is known to cause cytokine excretion. So um, I will forward you some uh, articles that you could forward to the rest of the group, which are, uh, medic which are studies, research, biological studies, nothing to do with homeopathy, where they, these guys study everything, right? So they study all that the saliva of the bed bug does to when they bite and they find the macrophage, They've mentioned the interleukins, they've mentioned the cytokines, granulocyte stimulating factors, many of these which are also in the postmortem reports. I am also sending the information that I have to the Virology Institute in India and uh, putting this idea to them that they would try the homeopathic remedy on an in vitro blood culture because we need the lymphocytes to do show some action uh, and also to kind of look at the similarities in uh, bed bug bites and the symptoms that are kind of coming through the xylome of the bed bug the saliva of the bed bug also contains a messenger rna and uh, the whole entire virus of this corona is actually a um, uh, like a puzzle of many different sequences. For example, there is sequence from the bat. Now they're saying there's HIV sequence there plus its own because viruses are known to steal bits of DNA and RNA sequences from their hosts. So I'm also kind of wondering if there is some similarity even there at an RNA level if this virus has actually stolen from its host and the bat bug and that has any similarity with this remedy by itself. Okay. There's one other question here. Uh, will you please keep us up to date with the results of these virology studies and if any hospitals use the Cymex in the results? I just pray for me, pray that the ethics committee, uh, <laughs> which is of course all allopaths uh, does uh, allow this through. Um, there have been interesting coincidences that two big hospitals I spoke to and I spoke to one of the person and as I was telling him, he said, um, Madam, I think you're treating my wife. So I was like, thank heavens. So <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it just looks like things may work out, but I just hope they will. And I will, of course, keep everybody informed uh, as soon as the study happens. In, the in, the, in between the study, whatever I do share with you has to be kept completely private. It cannot be publicized because unless the study is complete, we cannot uh, in between publish or talk about the results unless the you know entire committee agrees because then the study becomes null and void, right? Well, Divya, thank you so, so much. Wait a minute, we have one more question. Have any of your patients been in the later stage of disease? No, not yet. There have been no cases. And in this research study, in the exclusion criteria, we are going to put ventilator patients. However, I have been approaching the hospitals and the doctors and saying, if there are any cases that you're giving up on, that there is nothing that's uh, working right if the patient's family is giving consent just try this and the reason that I'm also saying this confidently I wasn't confident about this until um, one uh, patient whose um, uh, relative is a homeopath and um, um, felt that in this past one month his state was different he's according to her he seemed to have got really I mean 
too agitated in a different way than most other people about this. And in any case, he was due for a case taking. So I said, okay, I'll do it right now in any case. I have to tell you, I was very reluctant to do his case because he, was, he isn't easy to talk to. I mean, get into the five senses. And I was at this point saying, I want to see all COVID cases and collect data. This retake is not urgent. But in many ways, I, I was obligated to do it. And it was very interesting that he came in his background, childhood, to lice in the hair. And then I said, so have you seen lice? It was seven years age. And I said, have you seen lice? And he says, I've seen lice and I've seen bed bugs as well. Just spontaneously, out of the blue. And I was like, and where did you see bed bugs? He said, when my father was admitted in the hospital and was on ventilator for three months, and I would be sleeping outside on the bench, right? In, from the wood, I would constantly have these bed bugs and I would go into the washroom and take out my shirt and then try to find them. And I was like, again, like blown over because at that time, the question in my mind was, would we use this for ventilator patients? Would we use this? What symptoms can I get? How would I know whether we can use this for ventilator patients? You know, how can I say that with any kind of respiratory distress with any kind of surety? And here was this case who obviously was in, had got into this state and obviously his wife uh, picked it up somehow, understanding, I think, that there's something happening to him. And he tells me bed bug in the periphery of a ventilator, right? So that's when I said to these doctors, just try it, use it. And if your mortality rate drops, you'd know instantly, like if, if a number of cases you've given up on, right, suddenly start improving, it's definitely worth you trying it. So this is what I've been on compassionate use. So in epidemics like this, there is compassionate clinical use that comes under a ethical criteria. And I have been suggesting that they could do this on a compassionate use. Well, good luck. It seems like an unbelievably exciting opportunity. Um, and Please do give me your inputs um, for or against. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always my worst critic and always actually wondering, am I reading the patients? How are they saying this? It's just, luckily I have, I put in my uh, email, people were asking, so I put my email address. I have in my group, uh, one of my colleagues who we call the perennial skeptic. So whenever I say something, her, you know, I have one who will enthusiastically support me and there's one who will always say, but maybe, could it be a coincidence? Maybe you asked this question and suggested it to her. So I make sure she's in on all my cases. Uh, <laughs> because and, uh, for me, the, you know, the point was when she messaged me at the end of that uh, hospital case telling me this was freaky, right? Because it was like, almost like this person had heard me and was speaking the background scenes that would come. Divya, um, we've got a whole bunch of thank you, thank you, thank yous um, to deliver to you. Um, are you okay um, if we share your email? Mike, can I share your email address with the group? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I uh, love that. That. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's Divya. It's Divya Clinic, isn't it? Doctor Divya Clinic. I put it down there from me to everyone. I don't know if you can see that on the chat. Oh yeah, Dr. Divya Clinic at gmail.com. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, it's on the chat. Yeah, perfect. Well, anybody else? One last comment before we all go off. Um, lots and lots of Divya, lots and lots of thank you, Divya's. And yeah, from all of us, one huge, huge thank you. This was really an extraordinary opportunity for us. And it's amazing hearing your work. It's very, very exciting. So thank you. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Beth, for actually telling me, come on, you can wake up and go back to sleep. <laughs> Jane messaged me a few times saying, you can go back to sleep after that. You can go back to sleep. Good luck with that. Well, we're really grateful for you waking up so early for this. So thank no. you so, so much. And um, we really are keen to hear the results of your work. Me too. I, I really hope this goes through because if this research goes through, it'll also open the doors to so much more clinical trial that can happen with homeopathy. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm 
I am going all out in all directions in that way, saying, you know, it'll. This is the opportunity to open the doors and people to look at and understand. This is not just placebo. So yeah, uh, yeah. So my son wrote on my ethics committee thing for risk. He he wrote there. He says all present research shows that homeopathy has no effect on human intake. Hence, there is no risk at all. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm not going to write that. He said, no, that's what you need to tell them because they say it's placebo. So where's the risk at all, right? There's no risk. <laughs> so, so let's well, good let's luck. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good luck. And once again, thank you. And everybody. Okay, thank you. This was a great evening, everybody. Um, and we'll, uh, Ina, thank you. Terry, thank you. Um, and we'll be back. I'll, you'll hear from me by ne sometime next week. Don't you worry. Um, and keep up the good work. We'll keep sending referrals as we get them. And um, uh, Karen, thank you. Harula, where are I, wherever you are. There you are. Hi, Harula. <laughs> thank you. All right, and good night, everybody.